Section 16 of the Complete Works of Tacitus, edited by Thomas Gordon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Works of Tacitus, to which are prefixed political discourses upon that author. Edited and translated by Thomas Gordon, with introductory essays by Thomas Gordon. Volume 1. The Annals. Book 1. Part 3. The Sedition at Pannonia. Thus stood affairs at Rome, when a sedition seized the legions in Pannonia, without any fresh grounds, save that from a change of princes they meant to assume a warrant for licentiousness and tumult, and from a civil war hoped great earnings and acquisitions. They were three legions encamped together, all commanded by Junius Blasus, who, upon notice of the death of Augustus and the accession of Tiberius, had granted the soldiers a recess from their wonted duties for some days, as a time either of public mourning or festivity. From being idle they waxed wanton, quarrelsome, and turbulent, greedily listened to mutinous discourses. The most profligate amongst them had most credit with them, and at last they became passionate for a life of ease and riot utterly adverse to all military discipline and every fatigue of the camp. In the camp was one Percanius, formerly a busy leader in the embroilments of the theatre, and now a common soldier, a fellow of a petulant, declaiming tongue, and, by inflaming parties in the playhouse, well qualified to excite and infatuate a crowd. This incendiary practiced upon the ignorant and unwary, such as were solicitous what might prove their future usage, now Augustus was dead. He engaged them in nightly confabulations, and, little by little, incited them to violence and disorders, and, towards the evening, when the soberest and best affected were withdrawn, he assembled the worst and most turbulent. When he had thus ripened them for sedition, and other ready incendiaries were combined with him, he personated the character of a lawful commander and thus question and harangue them. Why did they obey, like slaves, a few centurions and a few tribunes? When would they be bold enough to demand redress of their heavy grievances, unless they snatched the present occasion, while the emperor was yet new, and his authority wavering, to prevail with him by petition, or by arms to force him? They had already, by the misery of many years, paid dear for their patient sloth and stupid silence, since decrepit with old age, and maimed with wounds, after a course of service for thirty or forty years, they were still doomed to carry arms. Nor, even to those who were discharged, was there any end of the misery of warfare. They were still kept tied to the colors, and under the creditable title of veterans, endured the same hardships, and underwent the same labors. But suppose any of them escaped so many dangers, and survived so many calamities, where was their reward at last? A long and weary march remained yet to be taken into countries far, remote, and strange, where, under the name of lands given to them to cultivate, they had hospitable bogs to drain, and the wild wastes of mountains to manure. Severe and ungainful of itself was the occupation of war, ten as is the day the poor price of their persons and lives. Out of this they must buy clothes and tents and arms. Out of this bribe the cruel centurions for forbearance of blows, and occasional exemption from hard duty. But stripes from their officers, and wounds from their enemies, hard winters and laborious summers, bloody wars and barren peace, were miseries without end. Nor remain there other cure or relief than to refuse to list but upon conditions certain, and fixed by themselves, particularly that their pay be a denarius or sixteen as is a day. Sixteen years be the utmost term for serving. When discharged, to be no longer obliged to follow the colors, but to have their reward in ready money, paid them in the camp where they earned it. Did the Praetorian guards, they who had double pay, they who, after sixteen years' service, were paid off and sent home, bear severer difficulties, undergo superior dangers? He did not mean to detract the merit of their brethren, the city guards. Their own harder lot, however, was to be placed amongst horrid and barbaric nations, nor could they look from their tents, but they saw the foe. The whole crowd received this harangue with shouts of applause, but from various instigations. 
some displayed upon their bodies the impressions of stripes, others their hoary heads, many their vestments ragged and curtailed, with backs utterly bare, as did all their various griefs in the bitterness of reproach. At length to such excessive fury they grew, that they proposed to incorporate the three legions into one, nor by aught but emulation was the project defeated, for, to his own legion, every man claimed the prerogative of swallowing and denominating the other two. They took another method, and placed the three eagles of the legions, with the standards of the several cohorts, all together, without rank or priority. Then forthwith digged turf, and were rearing a tribunal, one high enough to be seen at a distance. In this hurry arrived Blasus, who, falling into sore rebukes, and by force interrupting particulars, called with vehemence to all. Dip your hands, rather, in my blood. To murder your general will be a crime less shameful and heinous than to revolt from your prince. For, determined am I, either to preserve the legions in their faith and obedience, if you kill me not for my intended good office, or my death, if I fall by your hands, shall hasten your remorse. For all this, turfs were accumulated, and the work was already breast high, when, at last, overcome by his spirit and perseverance, they forbore. Blasus was an able speaker. He, he told them that sedition and mutiny were not the methods of conveying to the emperor the pretensions of the soldiers. Their demands, too, were new and singular, such as neither the soldiers of old had ever made to the ancient generals, nor they themselves to the deified Augustus. Besides, their claims were ill-timed, when the prince, just upon his accession, was already embarrassed with the weight and variety of other cares. If, however, they meant to try to gain in full peace those concessions, which, even after a civil war, the conquerors never claimed, yet why trample upon duty and obedience? Why reject the laws of the army and the rules of discipline? And if they meant to petition, why meditate violence? They might at least appoint deputies, and in his presence trust them with their pretensions. Here they all cried out that the son of Blasus, one of their tribunes, should execute that deputation, and demand in their name that, after sixteen years' service, they should be discharged. They said they would give him new orders when he succeeded in these. After the departure of the young officer, a moderate recess ensued. The soldiers, however, exalted to have carried such a point, the sending the son of their general, as the public advocate of their cause, was to them full proof that they had gained, by force and terror, that which, by modesty and gentle means, they would never have gained. In the meantime, those companies, which before the sedition began, were sent to Nalportum, to mend roads and bridges, and upon other duties, no sooner heard of their uproar in the camp, but they cast off all obedience, tore away the ensigns, and plundered the neighboring villages. Even Nalportum itself, which for greatness resembled a municipal city, was plundered. The endeavors of the centurions to restrain this violence, were first returned with mockery and contempt, then with invectives and contumelies, and last with outrage and blows. Their vengeance was chiefly bent against the camp marshal, Alphidianus Rufus. Him they dragged from his chariot, and loading him with baggage, drove him before the first ranks. They then insulted him, and asked it in scorn, whether he should bear such enormous burdens, whether endure such immense marshes. Rufus had long been a common soldier, then became a centurion, and afterwards camp marshal, a severe restorer of primitive strictness and discipline, an indefatigable observer of every military duty, which he exacted from others with the more rigor, he had himself undergone them with all patience. By the arrival of this tumultuous band, the sedition was again awakened to its former outrage, and the seditious roved abroad without control, ravaged the country on every side. Blasis, for an example of terror to the rest, commanded those who were most laden with plunder to be punished with stripes and cast into prison. For the general was still dutifully obeyed by the centurions, and by all the soldiers of any merit. But the criminals refused to submit, and even struggled with the guard who was carrying them off. They clasped the knees of the bystanders, implored help from their fellows, now calling upon every individual, and conjuring them by their particular names, then appealed to them in a body, and supplicated the company, the cohort, the legion, to which they belonged, warning and proclaiming that the same ignominy and chastisement hung over them all. With the same breath they heap invectives, without measure, upon their general, 
and called upon heaven and all the gods to be their witness and avengers, nor left they aught unattempted to raise the effectual hatred, compassion, terror, and every species of fury. Hence the whole body rushed to their relief, burst open the prison, unbound and rescued the prisoners. Thus they owned for their brethren, and incorporated with themselves, infamous revolters, and traitors convicted and condemned. Hence the violence became more raging, and hence more sedition from more leaders. There was particularly one Vubulenus, a common soldier, who, exalted on the shoulders of his comrades, before the tribunal of Blasis, thus declaimed in the ears of a multitude already outrageous, and eager to hear what he had to say. To these innocents, says he, to those miserable sufferers, our fellow soldiers, you have indeed restored breath and liberty, but who will restore life to my poor brother? Who, my poor brother, to me? He was sent hither by the German armies, with propositions for our common good, and for this was last night butchered by the same Blasis, who in the murder employed his gladiators, bloody men, whom he purposefully entertains in arms for our common execution. Where, O Blasis, hast thou thrown his mangled corpse? Even open enemies do not inhumanly deny burial to the slain. When I have satiated my sorrow with a thousand kisses, and a flood of tears, command me also to be murdered, that these our brethren may together bury my poor brother and me, slaughtered both as victims, yet both guiltless of any crime, but that of studying the common interest of the lesions. He inflamed those his complaints and expostulations with affecting sighs and lamentations, beat his breast and tore his face. Then those who carrying him gave way, he threw himself headlong to at the feet of his companions, and thus prostrate and supplicating, in them raised such a spirit of commiseration, and such a storm of vengeance, that one party of them seized and bound the general's gladiators, another, the rest of his family, while they ran and dispersed themselves to search for the corps. And, had it not been quickly manifest that there was no corps to be found, that the slaves of Blasis had upon the rack cleared themselves, and that Vibulanus never had any brother, they had gone nigh to have sacrificed to the general. As it was, they expulsed the camp marshal and tribunes, and, as they fled, plundered their baggage. They likewise put to death Lucilius the centurion, whom they had sarcastically named Cade Alteram, because when upon the back of a soldier he had broken one wand, he was wont to call for another, then a third. The other centurions lurked in concealment, all but Julius Clemens, who, for his prompt capacity, was saved in order to manage the negotiations of the soldiers. Even two of the legions, the eighth and the fifteenth, were ready to turn their swords upon each other, and had but for the ninth. Once Sirpicius, a centurion, was the subject of the quarrel. Him the eighth required to be put to death. The fifteenth protected him, but the ninth interposed with treaties to both, and with threats to those who would not listen to prayers. Tiberius, however close and impenetrable, and ever laboring to smother all melancholy tidings, was yet driven by those from Pannonia to dispatch his son Drusus thither, accompanied by the principal nobility, and guarded by two praetorian cohorts, but charged them with no precise instructions, only to adapt his measures to the present exigency. The cohorts were strengthened with an extraordinary addition of chosen men, with the greatest part of the praetorian horse, and the main body of the German, then the emperor's guards. Aelius Sejanus, lately joined with his father Strabo in the command of the praetorian bands, was also sent, not only as governor to the young prince, but, as his credit with the emperor was known to be mighty, to deal with the revolters by promises and terrors. When Drusus approached, the legions, for show of respect, marched out to meet him, not with the usual symptoms, and shouts of joy, nor with gay ensigns and arms glittering, but in address and accoutrements hideous and squalid, and their countenances too, though composed to sadness, were seeing greater marks of sullenness and contumacy. As soon as he was within the camp, they secured the entrances with guards, and in several quarters of it placed parties upon duty. The rest crowded about the tribunal of Drusus, who stood beckoning with his hand for silence. Here, as often as they surveyed their own numbers, and met one another's resentful looks, they uttered their rage and horrible cries. Again, when they beheld Caesar upon the tribunal, awe and trembling seized them. Now there prevailed a hollow and inarticulate murmur, next a furious clamor, then, suddenly, 
a dead silence, so that, by a hasty succession of opposite passions, they were at once dismayed and dreadful. When, at last, the uproar was stayed, he read his father's letters, who in them declared that he would take an affectionate care of the brave and invincible legions, by whom he had sustained successfully so many wars, and, as soon as his grief was a little abated, deal with the Senate about their demands. In the meantime he had sent them his son, on purpose to make them forthwith all the concessions which could instantly be made them. The rest were to be reserved for the Senate, the proper distributors of rewards and punishments by a right altogether unalienable. The assembly answered that to Julius Clemens they had entrusted what to speak in their name. He began with their demands, to be discharged after sixteen years' service, to have the reward which, for past services upon that discharge, they claimed, their pay to be increased to a Roman denarius, the veterans no longer detained under their ensigns. When Drusus urged that wholly in the judgment of the Senate and his father these matters rested, he was interrupted by their clamors. To what purpose came he, since he could neither augment their pay nor alleviate their grievances? And, while every officer was allowed to inflict upon them blows and death, the son of their emperor wanted power to relieve them by one beneficent action. This was the policy of the late reign, when Tiberius frustrated every request of the soldiers by referring all to Augustus. Now Drusus was come, with the same artifices to delude them. Were they never to have a higher visit than from the children of their prince? It was, indeed, unaccountable that to the senate the emperor should leave no part in the direction of the army only the rewarding of the soldiery. Ought not the same senate to be consulted as often as a battle was to be fought, or a private man to be punished, or were their recompenses to be adjudged by many masters, but their punishments to remain without any restraint or moderation whatsoever? At last they abandoned the tribunal, and with menaces and insults fell upon all they met, belonging to Drusus either as guards or friends, meditating thus to provoke a quarrel, and an introduction to blood. Chiefly enraged they were against Nius Lentulus, as one, for years in warlike renown, superior to any above the person of Drusus, and thence suspected to have hardened the prince, and been himself the foremost to despise these outrages in the soldiery. Nor was it long after that, as he was leaving Drusus, and from the foresight of danger, and returning to winter quarters, they surrounded him, and demanded whither he went, to the emperor or senate, there also to exercise his enmity to the legions and oppose their interest, and instantly assaulted him with stones. He was already covered with wounds and blood, and awaiting a certain assassination, when the troops attending Drusus flew to his assistance and saved him. The following night had a formidable aspect, and threatened the speedy eruption of some tragical vengeance, when a phenomena intervened and assuaged all. The moon and the mist of a clear sky seemed to the soldiers suddenly to sicken. They, who were ignorant of the natural cause, took this for an omen forbidding the issue of their present adventures. To their own labors they compared the eclipse of the planet and prophesied that, if to the distressed goddess should be restored her wanted brightness and vigor, equally successful would be the issue of these their struggles. Hence they strove to charm and revive her with sounds, and by ringing upon brazen metal, and an uproar of trumpets and coronets made a vehement bellowing. At last she appeared brighter or darker, they exalted or lamented, but when gathering clouds had utterly bereft them of her sight, and they believed her now buried in everlasting darkness, then, as minds once thoroughly dismayed or pliant to superstition, they bewailed their own eternal sufferings thus pretended, and that against their misdeeds the angry deities were contending. Drusus, who thought it behooved him to improve this disposition of theirs, and to reap the fruits of wisdom from the operations of chance, ordered certain persons to go round, and supply them from tent to tent. From this purpose he called and employed the centurion, Julius Clemens, and whoever else were by honest means acceptable to the multitude. They insinuated themselves everywhere, with those who kept watch, or were upon patrol, or guarded the gates soothing them all with hopes, and by terrors rousing them. How long, said they, shall we hold the son of our emperor thus besieged? Where will our broils and wild contentions end? Shall we swear allegiance to Percinius and Vobilenus, 
who have Ubelenus and Percinius support us with pay during our service, and reward us with lands when dismissed. In short, shall two common men dispossess the Neros and the Drusi, and to themselves assume the empire of the Roman world? Let us be wiser, and as we were the last to revolt, be the first to relent. Such demands as comprise terms for all, are ever slowly accorded, but particulars may, when they please, merit instant favor, and instantly receive it. These reasonings alarmed them, and filled them with mutual jealousies. Presently the fresh soldiers overtook the veterans, one legion separated from another, and by degrees returned the love of duty and obedience. They relinquished the guard of the gates, and the eagles and the other ensigns, which in the beginning of the tumult they had thrown together, were now restored to its distinct station. Drusus, as soon as it was day, summoned an assembly, and though unskilled in speaking, yet with a haughtiness inherent in his blood, rebuked their past, and commended their present behavior. With threats and terrors, he said, it was impossible to subdue him, but if he saw them reclaimed to submission, if from them he heard the language of supplicants, he would send them to his father to accept, with a reconciled spirit, the petitions of the legions. Hence, at their entreaty, for the deputy to Tiberius, the same Blasus was again dispatched, and with him, Lucius Apronius, a Roman knight and intimate companion of Drusus, and Justus Contonius, a centurion of the first order. There followed great debates in the council of Drusus, while some advised to suspend all proceedings till the return of the deputies, and by a course of courtesy, the while to soothe the soldiers, others maintained that remedies more potent must needs be applied. In a multitude was to be found nothing on this side extremes always imperious where they are not awed, and to be despised without danger when frightened. To their present terror from superstition was to be added the dread of their general, by his dooming to death the authors of the sedition. Rather prompt to rigorous counsels was the genius of Drusus. Vubulanus and Percanius were produced, and by his command executed. It is by many recounted, that in his own tent they were secretly dispatched and buried. By others, that their bodies were ignominiously thrown over the entrenchments for a public spectacle of terror. Search was then made for other remarkable incendiaries. Some were caught skulking without the camp, and there by the centurions or praetorian soldiers slain. Others were, by their several companies, delivered up. As a proof of their own fidelity, the consternation of the soldiers was heightened by the precipitate accession of winter, with rains incessant and so violent that they were unable to stir from within their tents or maintain common intercourse, nay, scarce to preserve their standards, assaulted continually by tempestuous winds and raging floods. Dread, besides, of the angry gods still possessed them. Nor was it at random, they thought, that such profane traitors were thus visited with black eclipses and roaring tempests. Neither against these their calamities was there other relief than the relinquishing of a camp by impiety contaminated and accursed, and after the expiation of their guilt, returned to their several garrisons. The eighth legion departed first, then the fifteenth. The ninth, with earnest clamors, pressed for continuing there till the letters from Tiberius arrived. But when deserted by the other two, their courage failed, and by following of their own accord, they prevented the shame of being forced. Drusus, seeing order and tranquility thus restored, without staying for the return of the deputies, returned himself to Rome. End of section 16